Can you, can you hear me? So, well, let's, let's, uh, let's start the, um, the afternoon session. And uh, it's a pleasure to, um, uh, to introduce El Sarcaute, that is a professor of, um, of complex systems in the University College in, in London. Um, she has been working now for, uh, for some, some years in uh, questions related to urban systems uh, and in all the aspects of, of, uh, of cities, so essentially from economic to mobility to land use. Uh, so uh, well, he, he will, uh, the, the talk that she's going to present uh, will compile several of these, uh, of these findings. And well, without anything else, this is a pleasure to, uh, to, to introduce uh, Elsa that will come out <laughs> in a fair take away. <laughs> Elsa, please. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. So it is a great pleasure to be uh, a keynote in this uh, in this uh, conference, which is my favorite. My the conference that I that I, that I very much love is very challenging after all these amazing keynotes that have been um, presenting uh, so far. So today, um, before introducing what I'm going to be doing, I want to introduce my collaborators. So these are the main people, thanks to whom everything that I'm going to be showing today um, have have been possible. And of course, uh, what they have in common. You know, so it's a, it's a huge range. There are more collaborators that I will be showing on the on the on the presentation. And what they have in common is that either they run marathons or they like tequila. So of course, you can imagine which one I am. Um, so in this type of setup, I don't need to to motivate really why we are thinking about uh, hierarchical systems. Why do we need to look at trees? to understand the relationship between the many different components in the system in order to see how we have knowledge spillovers, feedback, uh, and so forth. So these are some of the few examples of many of your colleagues and, and people that are in this room that have been working in this kind of system. So you have uh, from uh, urban systems, ecology, biology, the brain, finance, and so forth. So basically what I'm going to try to do today is through a set of three examples to more or less motivate how to construct these trees. So the main issue is that there is no unique tree. The way we're going to construct the network that will give rise to the tree is going to introduce biases and is going to introduce some issues that we have to take into account when we're going to construct our system in order to see how from these interactions we have this hierarchical structure. So I'm going to start first with the examples of agglomeration effects and spatial uh, dependencies. So very much since the work, you know, seminal work of Porter showing that you have this collocation, you have advantages in collocation of economic activities. So how do we look at these collocations? So in spite of the internet and all these things, we still observe these advantages and this collocation of economic activities in our space. So if you look at the work that has been done throughout the years in order to understand how this specific industry get together and get advantages of getting together, you will see maps of this sort. So you have, you have your system, you have your, 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 your map, and then you want to see what sort of fact, where are these specializations, where are in the space? And um, given this particular problem, people have been looking at trying to understand how better to cluster these activities, because of course, there are many different issues intervening of why uh, firms are going to cluster together uh, or not. And on the one hand, you have the problem of space, and on the other one, you have the problem of the type of industries that you have in there. So when you look at the type of industries and you want to look at collocation and so forth, one of the first things, you know, thinking about uh, um, the advantages of being together, you will see whether there is some sort of similarity. So in a paper like this one, um, what people say, okay, so first we select the industry and then we see where they collocate in the space. So first we cluster by industry, we select the specific industry that we want, and then we apply an algorithm in order to find in the, in the space where they are. You have other sorts of papers that do it the other way around. Let us first cluster by geography and then let us look at the industry classification and see what sort of advantages you have in the space in order to do that. And when you do this type of exercises, what you end up is with a map in which you have different types of clusters in which you have this specialization and this is collocation of economic activities. And you have a single realization of what you observe in the space. So 
what we try to do in, in this paper on the one hand is to see what happened with the structure of uh, the firms that are in London before and after the financial crash. And going beyond this idea of having a single realization in the space of where these firms are. So basically looking at the nest of structure. So if, if you think about this collocation of activities, if you think about the space, you are like, okay, so here I have a cluster of this type of specialization and next to it, there is a cluster of this other type. So it's not coincidence that next to it, there is a cluster of other type. So how is the relationship then at the next scale and so forth? Okay, so this is the sort of question that we were asking. What sort of qualities has the space in order to host this type of activities? And at which scale are you going then to do an intervention in order to see what sort of activities are going to be affected? And so we started this uh, analysis looking at, um, at London. So this is, this is work done in London only for, 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 for this specific thing. So you have the units of geography. And then in each of these units of geography, you will have a list of firms with their industrial classification. So you have, uh, you, you know exactly what, uh, what uh, they look like. So you can take centroids in each of these urban areas and then create your network having a link between these areas. So of course, how do you construct the link? And this is, this is the main issue of, of uh, what we were saying with respect to depending on how you're going to construct this network is the sort of structure, the sort of hierarchical structure that you're going to obtain. And so, According to the hypothesis, the framework, the theoretical framework that you're looking for is what you're going to do. So, for example, we know very well, looking at this type of studies, that you can do it by distance, as Porter did it at the beginning. You, you can have many sort of other um, relatedness and skill relatedness um, type of interactions between them. What we were looking for in this one is we... Since we're interested in, from the perspective of the space, we wanted to know what is the related interaction according to how close these things are in space, but also how similar they are with respect to their industrial classification. So how do you do this? So we want these two things to be happening at the, at the same time, to be close and to be similar. We don't want to do one and then the other. We want them both to be happening at the same time. And the uh, close, what does it mean to be close? So most of the time, maybe you will get the Euclidean distance between the centroid and things like that. But we were saying, we're interested in how people navigate the space. So we are in London. And even though you will have bits of the space that share boundary and look close, actually getting from one to the other is not that easy. So what we take, what we took in this case is the time that it takes in public transport to go from point A to point to point B, right? So the T there is the time it takes you to go in public transport. And then the similarity, you just get a similarity measure with respect to the industrial classification of this firm. So for the ones that, that want to know a bit more, so this is zip code uh, classification. And doing that, then you construct a joint probability distribution in which these two things are going to be happening at the same time. And the link is this joint probability distribution. And after you have your network then, you apply some sort of thresholding procedures. Or if you want to look at the other way, one is like a, a percolation process on the network saying that first the ones with high probability to be joined together are going to get joined and you continue and evolve the network until you have your fully connected network. So when you do this type of analysis, what you end up with is something like that. So instead of having one single realization of clusters in the space, what you have is one realization of clustering in the space for a specific jump in the system. So a specific, a specific threshold that you selected in the system. So for example, here you have for one jump, you have these different clusters that appear in the system. And this corresponds, if you want to look at the tree, to this one. As you relax the threshold and you start, you go through the percolation process and you start to join more bits and bits, you end up with something that looks like B over there and that will correspond to that one. So when we think about looking at the hierarchical structure is what is the relationship between this cluster here and this over there. So something very interesting in, in, uh, that, that happened when we did this, this work is that for example, temple here, if you only look at the structure of the tree and you see temple a line alone over there, you will say, okay, this must be a really disconnected place in the space because it's not connecting to the other ones. Temple is right in the middle. 
right in the center, like if you were to put a pin in the center of London, there you will have a temple. And what is going on is because it is looking at the type of activities that are going on in the space. Okay, so it's not what is going on in temple is very dissimilar to the other types of activities that are going in the space. So this is what this is speaking of. So when looking at what happened between before the financial crash and after the financial crash, the first thing you could see is that from this concentration of activities in the center, you ended up with an, with an expansion of these knowledge-based industries going, going more into the outer boroughs. So what knowledge-based industries are? So this relates to kind of scientific uh, uh, activities uh, in the space, technological and so forth. So there is a definition that we took given by the government with respect to what uh, these are. But I, I was uh, telling you, what we were interested in is to see how from the structure, can you say something about what happened to the system from the structure in the tree? So for example, here in 2007, before the financial crash, you could see Canary Wharf sitting all of there alone. So for the ones that don't know uh, uh, London, you have, um, so let me go back maybe. So you have the city, yeah, that is right right here. So you have the city, which is where all the banks are concentrated. And then because they couldn't fit anymore, <laughs> they went into Canary Wharf. So it's like the, the, the new financial district, so to speak, and all the banks were concentrated uh, over there. So after the financial crash, you could see that a lot of activity uh, ended up happening in Canary Wharf. So many of the, of the banks that went bust ended up creating new financial uh, um, firms and so forth. And so in 2007, you see Canary Wharf sitting on alone, and then you see all the, 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 the other clusters corresponded to some strategy that the government was planning in order to have some sort of tech, city clustering over there. And after the financial crash, you see a reconfiguration of the system. So you don't have Canary Wharf over here anymore. It's coming together closer to these other sectors and these other activities that are going on at the city center. In addition to other things happening, of course, in the, in the, in the system, given to all these uh, uh, investments and, and, and strategies. But what is very interesting to, 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 to think about is that you see these changes in the tree just because of a relocation of economic activities in the space. And so you could, you could think about, we took, if you remember, what we took in order to create this tree, we took the relationship between spaces with respect to travel time and similarity of industries. And this is what happens. So you have a reshuffling of the structure due to that. So then you can think the other way around. What if I connect these spaces more? What, how my tree is going to reshuffle after connecting these other spaces? Yes, so in this case, transport stay fixed. And the other thing that changed, the only thing that changed was that. But you can also think about, okay, so what you have shown us so far is how you have changes in the tree after you have a shock into the system. But you could, you could start thinking the other way around. So what gave rise to this kind of relationships with respect to space A and space B? So you can look into the generative mechanism that give rise to these type of networks. And I'm not going to spend time in this in this uh, in this uh, slide because just is going to give a talk about this and will explain every single term <laughs> how he's using that in his simulations in the in the in the next um, in the next satellite that I very much you know encourage you to come if you're really curious about how how this happened but mainly you can think about okay I'm trying to create a generative mechanism in order to try to introduce as many um, facts as possible, but as many little as not to over overburden my, my my system. And so, uh, just came up with this uh, with this uh, um, utility function, which is something that, uh, of course, you know, it has um, many type of uh, of, of issues, as uh, you heard uh, this morning. Um, and this is this is the sort of things that you can get. So this is this is with respect to relationships between firms in the whole of Europe. So then you can think about the scenarios that we're we're we're, we're living today. So we're living Brexit, and we're living now different financial shocks as well. So what sort of scenarios we cannot we cannot predict the shocks that are going to happen in the future. But what we can do is to generate different scenarios in order then to build up redundancies into the system to try to see how this could be absorbed. 
Okay, so we, we cannot do anything about the shocks, but how can we build these redundancies and look at these redundancies in the tree so that if there is a shock, maybe there is some sort of a possibility to, to, to have a, something a bit more resilient. Okay, so my next topic about transport networks, accessibility and governance. So why is it that we would like then to introduce transport investment into our systems, right? So of course people would argue, yes, we need transport investment because we need to connect people. We need to connect people to jobs. We need to reduce inequality. We need to increase livability. We need to increase the well-being of people. So think about active transport and so forth. And then at the country level, so this is when we think we have, we, we think in different ways at different scales. Okay, so at the, at the very local scales of the city, we introduce well being. At the level of the country, we're thinking about, for example, in the UK, rebalancing the economy. So this, this was well before Brexit, when Cameron was in power. Let us rebalance the economy, let us connect things. And uh, well, anyway. Of course, uh, uh, one of the one of the of the projects was HS2, which is you have a lot of wealth in the south. You have a lot of wealth in London. You have the post-industrial cities in the north not doing very well. Let us connect with a fast rail this system, right? And why? Because you want to rebalance the economy, leveling up, and so forth. Of course, for the people from the UK. You, you, you have your own, <laughs> your own thoughts about what is going on in, in, in that area. Right, so if we want to think about this tri type of investment, the first thing we need to do is to say, okay, so who is benefiting? If I'm going to be doing this, who is benefiting? What sort of thing I'm connecting to what and how I am measuring the benefit of that? And for this type of things, there is a big debate of whether you have the radiation model, the gravity model, the single constraint model, the <laughs> you have all this debate for the ones uh, doing transport of which is best than another one at which scale and how to deal with all of those. Okay, so this is yet another effort in order to try to, to look into those things. So in this example, you had, uh, you had a city, which is uh, Teresina in Brazil. And um, one, one thing that became something very kind of, um, how do you say, like, like trendy. You know, let us introduce a BRT system, a bus rapid transit system that will connect many different places in the city. Okay, so this, this became in, 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 uh, in many different countries, something that needed to be done. So you, you saw that a lot in Latin America, a lot in Asia going on. But the question is, who is it that I'm connecting with, right? So what you have uh, in this map over here, apologies, there is no legend. You have the population distribution in these areas. So you see the dark colors is a concentration of the population, larger population. And then uh, on the bottom one, you have the jobs. So one of the things, one of the main questions um, that uh, uh, Gabriela Uchoa, that is from Brazil, so this span from her master's dissertation, is who is benefiting from, from this? How is it that I can really see whether, whether this intervention is going to bring some benefit into the system? So one way to do this is, okay, let us get our models and let us see how the accessibility is going to change according to this intervention. And what you find, what, what, what you find is that this is before the intervention, this is after the intervention. So what do we mean by accessibility? So you have jobs distributed, you have people distributed, and how easy it is for people to go from one place to the other one, okay? And there are many different ways to measure that. It's either you take all these models that we were mentioning, you run your models and you compute your accessibility by trying to understand the flows from one place to another, given the type of transport that you have, or you take it, you take it easy <laughs> and you decide to create an accessibility function that just going to give you what is, how many jobs there are, with respect to the cost function, so the time it will take me to get over there without doing any type of modeling. And um, the answer was that regardless of the type of um, model that you use in order to, to compute the accessibility, you will find very similar behavior, okay? So you see all these peaks say whether there is better accessibility or not in and where in the space. So the black one, corresponds to the accessibility in which you didn't do any modeling, but you just consider where things were distributed in the space. And this is the only one 
that is not really behaving in the same way as the other and it's not really picking up many different changes. The amount of change is the one that will tell you that, that will be different. Okay, but overall the behavior within all these models more or less picks up the same type of, of thing. So if we think about improving the lives with respect to investment uh, in, uh, in transport networks, active travel nowadays is one of the things that people really are really interested in. So this is some work that uh, Valentina that is sitting over there has been developing together with uh, Ivan um, within the Rubicon project. That is something that um, is being developed at the Alan Turing Institute by Michael Batty. So mainly what you want to see is how you can integrate all these, these different transport modes into one single one. So you have, you, we have seen over, over, over these, uh, these days, on Monday in particular, we, we saw lots of talks with respect to different travel modes and so forth. But the first question when we're trying to do something like that, so if you have bus, of course, you have, you have your, your, your bus uh, timetables. If you have a car, well, let us, if you have the underground, you have that and you need to couple those things. But if you have cars, yes, so you take, you take the road network and you have that. If you have pedestrian or you have cycling, things become a bit more, more delicate. Why is that? Because the type of data that you're going to use in order to create your network has many different biases. And this is work that, uh, that uh, Valentina and Ivan have, have been working on in, or in order to try to see which one is, which, what sort of biases, not which one is best, maybe what sort of biases are introduced for those ones. So once you have your network, the next step is, I have this budget in order to create an intervention to expand, for example, my cycling uh, network. Where is it that I'm going to, 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 to put these cycling lanes? Okay, so the question of where to put the cycling lanes is not an easy question, a straightforward question to answer. First, because you need the right network in order to be able to know what is going on and have already a diagnosis of the system of what is happening. You need to know the, type, the commuters, you, you need to create, um, to compute the potential for cycling demand according to where people live and where people work, how much are they willing to do. You do the routing, considering the safety um, of the roads and the existing infrastructure. But then once you have all this, where do you put, where do you, where do you prioritize the investments? And there are many different ways of doing that. So in this paper, um, Hussein, who during his master's uh, uh, dissertation as well, developed this framework together with uh, Robin Lovelace, who is like, a, like a, you know, like the master of all these uh, um, cycling uh, networks and, uh, and packages. I very much recommend you to look him up if, uh, if you do this type of things. And then you, you see, okay, so I'm going to extend my network. How do I do that? I do it by connecting the network as much as I can, which is called an, an utilitarian approach, or do I look closely at the people that are commuting from one place to another, creating different communities and try them to do the investment in a more egalitarian way. And furthermore, so this is very different. So if you, if you think about on the one hand, you know, back in the day, people were thinking more about optimization of trips. Now is more thinking about inequality and this sort of, uh, this sort of things. But when you do this type of, uh, of interventions, you cannot only just build cycling lanes without bringing policy together in order to, 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 to get the people. So what you want is that the people that were not cycling before are going to take up cycling. So you also need to bring policy into it in order for people to take uh, cycling. But of course, this is at the city level. If we think at the country level, so for people that know me, this, these slides will go to my grave. They will be there in my epitome because I think I have presented them like for years. I absolutely love this thing. So, so what, is going, what is going on is that if you look at the connectivity um, of, uh, of the network in, uh, in the UK, so here it goes. Again, you can see how you have your cities creating region and then until you have the whole country together. So. What you have is like the model cluster of Britain right at the top, if you think about uh, getting rid of the weak links. And the first thing that separates it's Scotland, as we will soon see happening, maybe. Then the next bit, you have this north-south divide, which is something that is, you know, from Roman times, it's something that has been going on. And remember, this is only taking into account infrastructure, okay? Sorry. 
road network infrastructure, okay? I'm not considering rail or anything of the sort. And as you go down into uh, cutting the, the, the links, you end up with these regions. And so you can look at it in this way, or if you prefer, uh, look at it from the perspective of percolation, which is more or less the motivation of doing this, you can see how as you relax the threshold and allow for more links to connect in the road network, you create, you see the cities, and as you go through the network, then you see uh, you see how the largest uh, connected component um, evolves, and then you can see how these different uh, um, patterns emerge from these transitions. So one thing to note is the following. Here you have London. London is part of this blue this blue branch, okay? All the cities in the in the in the north, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, they are in this in they are they are over here and they don't connecting until they reach this model cluster. They're very, very far away with respect to the road connectivity in the space. And of course here you say, okay, so what we need to do is to think once you put rail into it, is how the structure of this tree is going to change and how things are going to connect once you have uh, uh, rails. So you 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 think about um, about the restructuring of the tree considering rail. Then the next bit is okay. So what do we care about this system of connectivity? We care about how people are commuting from one place to another, how they are using this space. So all this infrastructure is giving me the opportunity to see how. My, 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 my space is connected, is connected between the people that are traveling from one place to another. And again, we have Valentina here, who is, who is like the entropy goddess <laughs> in, in, her, in her PhD. So one of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, she was looking at is when, when you look at the flows where people are using the space in the different transport modes, so you have a diversity of, of flows with respect to where people come from, okay? So you might have one place that captures people coming from many different places and another one capturing and, and everybody commuting to the same place, or you have a more homogeneous distribution of those flows. So overall, what you can capture by looking at the flows of the commuter is the polycentricity versus the monocentricity of these different regions. But that's with respect to the scale. So if you look, for example, at this one over here, then you will see how you have Manchester and Leeds that end up functioning as attractors if you look at a very, at a smaller scale, at a more city regional scale, then the regional scale that will tell you this polycentricity with respect to all these cities that are contributing. And um, a very nice result looking at, uh, at the type of flows that go from one place to another if you consider the flows and you consider the skills of the people uh, going from one, from, from one place to another one, and you end up clustering all these different cities according to the commuting flows and according to the skills, you end up with this diagram here, okay? So you can see that there are five nice clusters appearing in the space, but look, the colors do not correspond to the clusters, okay? The colors are given by the cofenetic distance in the tree that doesn't take into account skills, doesn't take into account any of that. Okay, so just by looking at how far away one place is to another one in the tree, which is the cofenetic distance, you recover the same clusters that are given according to this commuting uh, uh, diversity and, and different types of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of skills of the people. Okay, so looking at the tree, it gives you a lot of information in that respect. Okay, so I want to finish uh, with uh, this, uh, this, uh, with the sociodemographic uh, connectivity. I have five minutes. To, okay, <laughs> the, the sociodemographic connectivity. So uh, this is an example uh, from my home uh, city, uh, Mexico City. So this is this is how. Uh, Mexico City looked before colonization, so this is uh, 1325 to 1525, uh, and then you can see Tenochtitlan, you know, who, which, who has a, which has a population of 200,000 people, look more like a Venice, okay? So you had lots of canals going on, lots of water, lots of uh, agriculture and so forth, and different types of activities going on 
in the city. This is not how it looks like nowadays. And if you're curious and visit the Palace of La Almudaina, you will see that there is this painting hanging in one of the, of the walls over there, which corresponds to Paseo de la Alameda, which is right in the city center of Mexico City. So this is how it looked like, I don't know from which century it is, it might say somewhere, but a few centuries ago, and this is how it looks like uh, uh, today. So the problem with Mexico, with Mexico City, is that there is no water. So back in the day, you could see that it was like a Venice, lots of canals going on over there, but now there is, there is a big problem of water. So there is water scarcity, uh, uh, problems with respect to water infrastructure, water distribution, water pollution, and so forth. And the problem is really, really complicated. It's not something that you can just uh, take one solution and fix the whole thing. And so um, I had the opportunity to work with a, with a with these with these people uh, over here, in order to try to look at one aspect of the problem. So the main PI was Andrew Buckwith, who is an earth scientist, and his main area of research is is water, yes, hydrology and all these type of things. And so the main thing is okay. So of course, you know. <laughs> We are not going to solve the problem of water in a grant, in a research project, but maybe one aspect that uh, you can look at is the socio-hydrological resilience in Mexico City. Why? In order to try to bring up small strategies in order to mitigate this problem. So one of the strategies is to bring these constructed wetlands. So what these things do is more or less clean the water at a very local level. So instead of, instead of thinking about a big infrastructural pro problem, because it's a very complicated issue, let, let us start a small scale and trying to introduce this new technology into the city. So how to do this is the same problem as before with the cycling ones. Where are you going to introduce? Where are you going to prioritize? So you, you do not have an infinite amount of investment in order to put these things everywhere. Where would you put them? So this, this is more or less what we try to, to, to answer. So. Um, the first problem we encounter is that, as you can see, it was in Mexico City. If we go back to the slide of what do you mean by the definition of Mexico City, so people that have been to Mexico City must have been overwhelmed. It's, it's, it's absolutely... It's big, yes. It's, it's really, really big. And um, if you only take this very limited definition of the city, it will say that it's 9 million people. My experience of Mexico City is more around the 22 million people that can be considered within the metropolitan area. So the difference between this metropolitan area and many other metropolitan areas that are considered is that here you have almost a continuous space, okay? You don't, you don't have these clusters, these satellite places from which people are commuting uh, there. So the first thing is that, okay, we cannot take the whole of the metropolitan area. How do we extend this area of Mexico City in order to consider the most important places that are connected to it? And so what we did is try to look at this idea of the social demographic network. So you have, you have we took uh, the metropolitan area. Here I'm only illustrated the results. You create... Uh, you create a centroid in each of these areas, and then you create in the same way that we did with the firms, you create a link that corresponds to this similarity between sociodemographic profiles that you have over there, okay? And uh, at the same time, you also see the connectivity of the space. So by looking at the proximity with respect to the connectivity in the space in the same way that we did for the UK. And looking at the proximity with respect to the, the sociodemographic profile of the people, we saw that these places were, so, were the first ones to be integrated to the main system that we decided to add those. So which, what, what are those places? So, so just to illustrate, you know, because maybe when you see these maps, and especially these ones that I have to update, <laughs> um, they look so small, yes? So one of the areas that we extended is this red one area here. That area, only that area, has 1.1 million people, okay? And it's called Ciudad Netzahualcoyot. Ciudad means city, 
Okay, so it's a it's a it's a space that is it's almost considered like a city. Okay, one million people in there, very much connected to the rest of uh, of uh, of the city. And as you can see, it's a, it's a quite a, a deprived area. And so, if you perform the index of socio-hydrological vulnerability of the spaces, you can more or less see what is going on. So for, for the people that are interested, uh, we created this web tool in order for stakeholders to be able to more or less see what is going on according to the level of investment that you have, where would you put it? Um, when you have identified the most vulnerable places, then you need to think about where I'm going to construct these uh, wetlands. And that is not only with respect to which are the most vulnerable ones, but where can you put them with respect to the topography of the space and so forth. So it's not as easy as that. And having done that, according to the level of investment, you can then decide where to put your constructed uh, wetland. And this will give you more or less, you know, the people that um, the amount of litters that you're filtering with this with this one, the amount of people, of jobs that you're creating, and so forth. And so the, the few reflections, so instead of a summary, uh, the reflections that I would like you to take home is that um, mainly when, when you're looking at all these systems, you want to understand the relationship between the different elements at the different scales, instead of only looking at one single scale. Why is that? Because um, on the one hand, you want to see how something is going to spread into the system. If you do an intervention at the regional level, how is it going to spread to the rest of the system? Be aware of spillovers. You will see that the latest chancellor was sacked because of the conclusions of this sort. But um, in, 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 in any case, um, you also want to see who is being included in this type of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of interventions. But most of all, the idea of trying to understand from the perspective of the tree, the changes within the tree, the changes in the system by looking at the tree, how to build the redundancies into the tree in order to, to look at more resilient uh, um, systems is one of the main goals. And to finalize, I just I don't want to I don't have a job to advertise, unfortunately, but Alvaro Corral, who might be over there, has a job to advertise, and I'm collaborating with him in this one, a postdoc. Talk to him if you want to 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 apply to this. And also that after this talk, please run to our uh, if you want to know more about all of these aspects, please come to our satellite session. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Elsa. So, questions? Uh, you have. Thank you so much, Elsa, for your inspiring keynote. I had a question on the work you presented on, on active travel, and you were presenting different models, the gravity model, the radiation model. I was curious, you've also presented work at different scales from the city to the country. And so looking at different scales, different modes, which model uh, in which context feels the most adequate to you between these different models you presented? Right. Okay. So, so, so this is this framework of trying to introduce many different uh, um, transport uh, model, transport modes in one model at different scales is like the main project that Michael Vati, who is the founder of CASA, has been has been uh, undertaking for, for many, many years. And Jules Rambo and Fulvio worked very closely <laughs> with him in, in, in this project. So it's not it's not a, it's not a, a, an easy task in order to try. So what, what you can the way you can see it for the people, especially in this audience, is that you have a multi-layer network that has different types of resolutions at different scales. So how do you do you do you couple all these multimodal networks? take it into account as well the frequency of all these transport modes and not only you know like the fact that they exist in all these different uh, layers so quant is the place to go i can send you a link to 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 this uh, paper okay. i had, had a question i don't know whether you still have it thank you uh, lovely i have a quick question about the method um going from one layer to the next layer with a different threshold how do you propagate the colors Oh yes. Okay. Right. So 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 basically, what I do is that um, I only I only I only color the ten largest cluster at each of the of the of the thresholds. So many. If you look at the tree, actually, the tree is huge. 
but I'm, I'm trimming the tree in order to present only the 10 largest clusters. So at each threshold, because what you have is a multiplicity, a multiplicity of transitions, you don't have only the one. And so instead of having just a transition to the largest connected component, you have this multiplicity. So you don't have, you will have the largest connected component doing all these transitions, but you also have the second one and so forth. So in each of the thresholds, for example, in one threshold, you will have London as the biggest, uh, uh, as the largest uh, uh, component, but in the next one, London is no longer part of this, of this one, but it goes to another one. So at each threshold independently, I look at the 10 largest or 15 largest uh, clusters. Okay, here you are. Hi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so well, thanks uh then the speaker again and we can pass to the satellites. <laughs> Thank you. 